These striking and sometimes upsetting images show the impact of just some of the millions of landmines still scattered around the world. Even long after a war is over, these remnants lie in the earth ready to maim or kill. Today, the UN's marking the International Day for Mine Awareness. I'll be talking to the man who took these pictures in a moment. But first, Guillaume Zaire from the charity Handicap International spoke to the BBC about the threat from landmines in one of the world's best-known trouble spots at the moment, Syria. Know from, from the heavy fightings and the intensification of the conflict in Syria that there are lots and lots and thousands of explosive remnants of war uh, that are very everywhere in the, the fighting ground and in residential area. And Syrians, when will they will go back to their country, that will be a major issue. And I think we can estimate that it will take decades before uh, Syria will be cleared of mines. So I think there is a large effort to be prepared in terms of risk awareness and sensitization to the uh, Syrians, as well as clearing and demining inside Syria will be a huge need uh, when access will be uh, available in Syria. Well, it is a particularly poignant occasion for the BBC journalist Stuart Hughes, who's alongside me now. Ten years ago, Stuart lost his leg below the knee when he stepped on a landmine reporting on the war in Iraq. Also, let's, uh, we can speak to Sean Sutton. He is the Mines Advisory Group's award-winning uh, photographer. Uh, he joins us from our Salford studios. Um, Stuart, if I can just start with you. Ten years ago, this happened. Just describe the immediate aftermath. And did you realise what had happened? Presumably, you knew you were in a minefield. Uh, we didn't. Um, like so many minefields around the world, there were no posters, there were no flags, there was nothing there to say it was a minefield. If it was, uh, if it was marked out, we wouldn't have gone there in the first place. It just looked like a normal field. But unfortunately, the area that I was working in for the BBC that I went to uh, film was very heavily mined. I subsequently found out I stepped out of a vehicle. I heard an explosion. At that stage, I had no idea what it was. I just knew something had gone bang. I looked down, I looked at my leg and, and saw that my leg had suffered severe injuries. And it was in the confusion in the seconds afterwards that I was able to take stop and realise just how serious my injuries were. Uh, and now you are a campaigner for the ab ab abolition of, of landmines, but has there been much progress? Because, for example, the, the US hasn't, hasn't even signed this yet, have they? Even though they are committed to eradicating mines and clearing up mines around the world. There is an Ottawa mine ban treaty and more than 140 countries have signed up to it and it has been very successful. As you say, some of the big countries that have in the past used landmines, the United States, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, haven't signed up to the treaty. What campaigners say is that even countries that haven't signed up to the treaty are in de facto compliance of it, that the treaty has said, had such a stigmatising effect that even those countries that haven't signed up are not using the weapons in the way that they did 10, 15 years ago. Sean, 12 people, I think, on average a day die from landmines around the world. Just talk us through some of the places you've been and the, the impact and the effects that has had. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's pretty tragic, as you can imagine. If you, many people have no choice but to live in contaminated environments. Um, often it's their ancestral homelands, and um, to use other land, they would have to you pay people to do that, and they don't have any money. Um, most people in um, places like Cambodia and Angola knew that they were in a minefield um, when they stood in a mine. So um, it's the work that we do um, to clear the ordnance which, and the landmines, which makes a, a massive difference. Um, you can't um, rebuild your life. You can't have peace and security. You can't safely access water um, and if there are landmines around. How, how much of this is charted, though? I mean, how many maps exist locally in the areas you've been showing where mines have been laid? I know very, very few examples uh, anywhere around the world where there are maps of minefields. And often um, in places like Cambodia, where the fighting went on for decades, a village would be a strategic position because of uh, shade from trees and water. And so one side would take it, mine it, and then another side would take it, mine it again. Um, and this would go on for decades. So it's, um, it's a patchwork quilt, if you like, of, of minefields. And, the big issue for us is actually finding where the mines are. When we know where, we are, where they are, we can actually deal with them safely. Uh, I think, let's just uh, show some of your pictures, uh, Sean, as we uh, carry on talking to you. I, I think we've got uh, one from, uh, in fact, this looks like it's from uh, Cambodia, uh, and also, I think, from the DRC and uh, South Sudan. And just as we look at those pictures that Sean took, uh, award-winning photographs, let's go back to Stuart. 
what more progress, as we, as we see these images, Stuart, do you think can be, can be made? When you think about China, for example, and the production of mines there, we talked about the United States, uh, the fact that the United States want to keep mines, I think, in place on the DMZ between the two uh, uh, Koreas just to stop any ground invasion there. What sort of message is that sending out? In some ways, it, it could be seen as a mixed message in that the United States, for example, hasn't signed up to the Ottawa Treaty, and yet at the same time, it's the largest single donor to, to mine action. So there is a bit of a mixed message going out there. And what campaigners are saying, with such great progress being made towards the eradication of mines, is that now is the time that great progress has been made for those countries that have in the past used mines uh, by the hundreds of thousands to really show leadership and sign up to the treaty. They're not using mines at the moment, and, and that's very reassuring. But that the possibility is always there until they've put pen to paper and signed up to the treaty that they can use mines. And of course, this is going to continue to be a problem for many decades to come. It's not a problem that's gone away. Yeah, and uh, Sean, just a final comment from you. I mean, how much would it cost, do you think, to eradicate, to clean up all the mines around the world? Or is that just mission impossible? It's very, very difficult to know. Um, it really is. I mean, there were sort of there was widespread contamination um, across uh, Europe after the Second World War, and that was dealt with uh, over a few years because there were the resources to deal with it. The problem is, is the access to resources, and um, most of these countries around the world um, that are affected uh, are also the poorest countries in the world, and they don't have the resources to to clean up. Um, so at the moment it's dealing with it priority by priority, so clearing the land that is most needed by people. But uh, I don't think we can say that they'll ever all be cleared. Um, like it's the same in Europe, there's always going to be a residue afterwards. And we, we have teams in the UK and Germany and other places that, um, that are there to deal with that. And we need to build that capacity up in the other parts of the world. All right. Well, Sean, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us and uh, showing us uh, your photographs. And uh, Stuart Hughes, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this is the 10th anniversary. You've lost your leg to a landmine in Iraq.